morning everyone. Uh, my name is Katerina Gonos and I'm a project engineer here at WMG. I'm working in the energy storage group at the moment, uh, specifically on new battery technologies, which I'll go into a bit later. So before I came to WMG, um, I was still here at Warwick studying chemistry and I did this for four years. And I chose chemistry because I love the way that it explained sort of macro level processes and things that we see in our day to day lives at the sort of atomic or molecular level. So today I have the chance to combine, you know, that love of chemistry for my pure subject with what I currently work on and speak to you a little bit about these lithium ion batteries, why lithium and where, where we're gonna go from lithium. So I'm willing to bet that very close to you right now, you have either a laptop, a mobile, ph mobile phone, perhaps a set of car keys, um, or a watch on your wrist. And I want to, want to ask you what all these things have in common. Given the title of my talk, it's a bit of a giveaway, uh, you'll realise that they are all battery powered. But the batteries inside them are quite different. You just have to look at the, you know, even just the, the physical shape or size of them to realise there's some differences here, there's something going on. And batteries come in a variety of chemistries. You might have heard of, you know, names such as lead acid, nickel metal hydride, alkaline batteries, and of course, lithium ion batteries. And even though these batteries can look very similar, for example, the double A in your TV remote might look a lot like the cylindrical cells that Tesla uses in some of their packs, but you wouldn't trust those AAs to drive you across the world, for example. So why is that? So lithium ion has been hitting the headlines lately, even though it has been in our devices for a number of years now. and you know, today I just want to explain a little bit about why that is. So lithium ion batteries are now coming into the forefront as you know, bring great potential for a greener future for us. You've probably heard of Tesla. More and more car companies are pledging to go fully electric sort of within the next 10 years or so in line with national and international CO2 targets. So to this end, they are choosing, lith well, a lot of them anyway, are choosing lithium ion batteries to achieve this. But that's not all. Lithium ion batteries can also help us achieve a greener future by acting as the energy storage system for stationary applications. So these would be for our renewable energy sources like wind or solar. And this would be very useful perhaps during periods of downtime or when we have a surge in demand. And that's very useful also in countries which have very temperamental weather like the UK. Finally, some people believe that these batteries could even keep us in the skies one day, helping to make aviation a much greener industry than it currently is, which is really important because it is a major CO2 emitter. So that's where the lithium ion batteries are going, but where did they come from? So arguably the first sort of recognized battery uh, is the, was the creation of the Italian scientist Alessandro Volta uh, with his zinc and copper stacks. So he stacked zinc and copper, separated it with cardboard and soaked the whole thing in salt water. And this, even though he didn't actually correctly explain why it was working, he did manage to get a current out of this very crude setup, although it only lasted for about two hours, which is not bad considering it's got cardboard in there. So since then, that 200 years have passed since that point, and about 22 different chemistries have become commercially viable in that time. Uh, some of them I've listed here on the timeline, which might be most recon recognisable to you. It's important to realise that because of the complexity of the battery system, there hasn't really been a single eureka moment, and it's been a kind of a series of small improvements over time. The basic setup of the battery hasn't changed hugely since Volta's zinc copper stack. Um, you still have your two electrodes, a positive and negative one, the anode and the cathode, uh, perhaps made of metals or metal oxides, and then perhaps some type of carbon material on the anode. And this whole system will be immersed in a liquid electrolyte and connected by an external circuit which allows current to flow as uh, ionic charge carriers move between the two electrodes in this electrolyte. So that kind of basic setup hasn't changed hugely. Um, and we have seen, of course, improvements over the years, but again, because of the complexity of the system, this improvement hasn't been perhaps as rapid as with other technologies. Um, I saw this kind of interesting fact recently that 
if batteries had improved at the same rate as transistors, for example, the Tesla, uh, it was the Tesla pickup truck battery pack would now have the same energy as a supernova explosion, which obviously it doesn't. Um, since the 70s, we've seen about a 5% increase in battery capacity year on year. And that brings us then to lithium ion battery, which was commercialized after the efforts of Moroccan, uh, Moroccan, Japanese, American scientists, was commercialized by Sony in the 1990s, uh, initially for use in their camcorders, and it sort of exploded from there. So enough history and onto the chemistry. And here we have all the elements arranged very conveniently into one periodic table. And I've highlighted here also the elements, or some of the elements that are present in those 22 chemistries I mentioned earlier. Um, looking at them, you might be able to see some patterns in where they are on the table. Uh, and that's important because obviously this thing wasn't just thrown together, they exist where they are for a particular reason. But the element we're interested in today, or the elements, are on the far left. So here we have, of course, lithium. So lithium is the lightest of the metals in its group and it's also extremely, well it's the lightest, it's smallest, it allows us to uh, access very high energy densities and high voltages. So almost since its discovery it became very electrochemically relevant. Um, it's also very small, which is, is which very small and very lightweight, which allows it to shuttle very quickly between those two electrodes. Um, and you're able to intercalate quite a lot of those ions into your electrode materials versus some of the other bigger ions like sodium and as you move further down, further down the group. Um, lithium ion, because of the high energy density, energy in the capacity that you can access, it is sort of the ideal anode material. Um, but unfortunately, it does have some big kind of safety drawbacks when trying to use it like this because um, it's quite reactive. It means that kind of a manufacturing scale, it, it's not particularly nice to work with. And even in the battery, it has a tendency to grow fingers or dendrites that can reach across from the anode side to the cathode, short circuiting the battery, which can then lead to battery fires, such as you see here. Lithium ion also might not be the best, met uh, the best battery chemistry of choice for other applications. It's great, at the moment it is to the highest energy density we have, the highest power. Uh, we have to consider the different, very different applications that we have lined up for it. So you have electric vehicles where you want to have uh, high power, but also quite lightweight packs. And then you have stationary storage where you can get away with having lower power, you can have bigger packs, more packs. Um, but also the key features there are going to be safety, which is something that lithium ion it kind of, it, it's kind of lacking in that sense. So you need to consider the different applications for these chemistries and realize it's not necessarily one size fits all situation. The other major issue with lithium is its supply and abundance. So here we have the periodic table, but it's not as you know it. It shows the relative abundance of all of the elements uh, on earth. And as you'll see, lithium there is in yellow, meaning it's not going to last forever. Exact estimates do vary. Um, so it's hard to get exact numbers on this, but if you know, just looking at the projected uh, increase in demand from electric vehicles alone, could see us suffering some uh, pretty serious shortages by the end of the century. And we'll find ourselves once again back in that similar situation that we find uh, with non-renewable fossil fuels. Uh, of course, this increased you know, strain on the uh, supply will translate to higher, temp uh, higher costs for customers and also potentially issues for the countries where these materials are coming from. <clears throat> um, also another, you know, similarly, another issue is that the recycling processes for lithium ion batteries are not very well developed currently. So you have these you know, materials in there, uh, which are expensive and not particularly abundant, and we're struggling to reclaim them currently from, from these batteries at the end of their life. Uh, another issue as well, as I touched on earlier, is the sort of the, the ethical issues associated with lithium, uh, with lithium ion batteries and the materials in them. So similar to oil, uh, a lot of the countries where we derive these materials from, where they're sourced, aren't perhaps the most economically developed or, you know, particularly stable politically. And by increasing the demand and the, the need to exploit the resources, 
we're likely just to see even more kind of political issues and ethical issues as well, and environmental problems. So, for example, a lot of the world supply currently comes from South Amer countries in South America, so we have in Chile, Bolivia, Argentina. Um, in these countries, quite often, lithium is mined from salt plains like these, where thousands and thousands of gallons of water are pumped into the salt flat, causing the lithium to rise to the surface where it then can then be harvested. Um, this can draw water away from local farmers, depriving their crops and livestock of water. Another issue is that this water, this contaminated water, can leach into local water supplies. Uh, in Tibet alone, um, there was, in one year there were three separate instances where a lot of livestock was killed by this contaminated water. So clearly there are some issues with lithium. So we can go back to our table to try and find a solution. And bear in mind what I said earlier about the arrangement of the table and the properties of these elements. You might be able to guess where that solution is coming from. And if you're thinking sodium, then you'd be correct. I'm a little bit biased here because my work, as I said, I work on future technologies and I'm working currently on sodium ion batteries. But they do have a number of benefits over lithium. A key one is that the, of course, as we discussed just now, is the supply. Sodium is the sixth most abundant element uh, on, on the Earth. And we can kind of consider the sea an infinite resource. So if we can successfully extract sodium from that and use that as our source, then you know, we're pretty much set when it comes to supply of sodium. Um, also, the materials, the other materials used in the sodium ion battery are kind of more ethical, more sustainably sourced a lot of the time. For example, in my own work, um, I work with materials that are coming from bio-waste. They're coming from coconut shells. So that is obviously a much more sustainable and also a lower cost option compared to some of the materials used in uh, lithium ion batteries. Uh, in terms of processing as well, sodium ion batteries are very similar to lithium ion. You're changing the exact materials that you're using at the electrodes, obviously you'll change your ion, but the setup is extremely similar, so you can use the same equipment, the same processes that you use for lithium ion currently. So you don't have to worry, you know, at industry level, they don't have to worry about paying for very expensive new pieces of kit um, and retraining people. In terms of safety as well, um, sodium ion batteries, unlike their lithium counterparts, can be discharged safely to zero volts. So this is very good when it comes to, in terms of transporting them, um, especially if you're transporting them perhaps to like off, offshore uh, sites for use in stationary storage. Um, so yeah, you have a lot of safety benefits in that sense. Um, and as I said before, they are and because of that safety element as well, it makes them better for these stationary storage applications. So the last 200 years have brought us 22 different chemistries, uh, different, 22 different battery chemistries. So I want to ask you what you think the next 200 might bring. Sodium is just one possible option being explored because one thing's for certain, these batteries aren't going anywhere anytime soon. And this means that we really need to start looking beyond what is convenient or conventional if we want to create a greener future for everyone. Because if we're working on these technologies, we're trying to improve future, the lives of future generations, that needs to be a better future for all people, not just for the privileged few. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed. Mm -hmm.